see regulators or traditional insurance industry people have like when they're confronted with an, an example that really just makes them get decentralized systems? Yeah, I think that the, the, the probably the first and very important use of decentralized financial uh, systems in insurance will be to provide capital for many types of climate risks that the traditional industry is you know, not uh, looking to uh, insure. So you talk about wildfires in California, you talk about hurricanes in Florida, <laughs> there is very little capacity for things like that. You know, you have exclusions, you have tons of deductibles, you have lots of issues with people who live near coastlines or, uh, you know, forest areas. And that's just in the U.S. where you have a very well-developed financial system overall. As you start getting to other countries, you find more and more gaps that are not being filled by traditional insurance. And, uh, you know, it's estimated that a trillion dollars, that's trillion with a T, of just crops is uninsured. So there's no shortage of gaps. And this is where I think traditional finance has, has really uh, been lacking. And a decentralized way to raise capital that can then ensure these kinds of risks using the benefit of smart contracts and oracles like Chainlink to really automate the process will keep costs low for users and get them much needed insurance uh, where, you know, so far, they've just been left at the mercy of, uh, you know, the elements. Hey, welcome to Chainlink Live. My name is Andy Boyan with Chainlink Labs, and I'm here with Sid Ja from Arbol and D-Climate. We're going to hear about D-Climate today and decentralized climate data, what that means for insurance, what that means for decentralization, how Chainlink plays a role, and Sid, it's awesome to have you here. We just heard uh, a little bit about how traditional insurers are, you know, some of the weaknesses that they have in terms of being able to insure broadly in, in sort of extreme events. And it's just not practical for them to, 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 to build an insurance product and raise money for it. But if you do so in a decentralized way, there's a lot of other opportunities that open up. So uh, a fascinating use case uh, there. I'd really like to start um, and have you give an introduction of D-Climate in particular um, so our audience can hear. The Chainlink community is fascinated with new use cases for Chainlink and new data. And I think this is just an awesome use case thinking about climate data. So give us a, a brief introduction. Yeah, sure. Uh, so D-Climate is the first decentralized network for climate data, forecasts, and models. Our goal is to connect publishers of climate data and forecasts with consumers in a standardized marketplace where we intend everyone to be on a level playing field. So not just the biggest marketing budget winning the customers, but you know groups and entities with the best models. Um, the idea is that publishers of any size can monetize their work product. Consumers of any size can come in and purchase data and forecasts in a way that you know, they are best informed. At, the, at this, uh, you know, in the current state of the world, First, you have huge gaps in the climate data. And where you do have data and forecasts, it's hard to know who has the best uh, forecasts out there. And uh, you know, we want consumers to have that information at their fingertips. We want a network that responds to consumer needs and uh, you know, incentivizes new data to be added. And uh, the idea is that uh, by providing uh, decentralized validation and an open marketplace, you start to chip away at the silos that currently, you know, hold back this uh, whole ecosystem. So when you're talking about any size player can now come into the data marketplace, are, are there limits right now that are, or, or really big players, they don't get into smaller markets or like deep, you know, at the county level or city city level in, in some cases that would be, that this would solve? Yeah, so there, when you look at the, climate information ecosystem, you have uh, a number of very well-meaning, uh, uh, you know, sort of government agencies, NGOs, and other academic groups that provide some base layer of data. On top of that, you have uh, a few very large entrenched private players and a whole host of growing uh, but small startups that focus on particular subsections of the market. Mm -hmm. Maybe some focus on soil moisture, maybe some focus only on weather data in Argentina and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. the problem is 
they, it's very hard to navigate between these different groups. Um, the public data is extensive, but very difficult to utilize unless you basically have a degree in, in these fields. And a lot of the private data sources are very expensive. And uh, a lot of what they do is black box and opaque. So we want to tackle all these problems by providing that open, uh, uh, you know, transparent standard where that's the starting point. Get all the, uh, you know, the public freely available data in one standard. I mean, some of these things, you know, you have to download, uh, uh, you know, gigabytes of data to get one location's mm -hmm. uh, information. Then on top of that, you start to encourage private sector to incentivize uh, growth in where the market needs. You know, a lot of the academic work and all that is not uh, driven by market forces. So let's say we're running an insurance program in southern Brazil and we don't have great data. It's hard to incentivize anyone to put up data in the current framework. It's very haphazard. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea is for the network to be responsive to the growing needs uh, of the consumer mm -hmm rather than just being based on what uh, has been done historically. So um, th th it's hard to get data if you're not an expert, which means it's hard to build products unless you have an expert. So it's expensive to build products and, yeah. and that hinders mm -hmm. innovation. So much like, you know, I, I feel like it, the Chainlink Labs, we talk about if we build the infrastructure and make the data available, then people will build with it. So it really sounds like that same sort of uh, idea here. Absolutely, and that's what we want to be. We want to be a base layer where, you know, using user-friendly APIs or graphical user interfaces, you can get a lot of this data, but then we want to encourage companies to build on top of it. So imagine uh, when somebody puts up a lot of raw satellite data, then another hmm. uh, company can build a flood detection or wildfire detection algorithms on top of that. And a yet another company could build a credit risk model for a bank that's having mortgages in an area that's susceptible to wildfires. Mm -hmm. So you can have layers of companies that start to build uh, an ecosystem of where the market needs are really growing really fast. Something I noticed, uh, I was reading the white paper and this is it's a really accessible white paper, the D-Climate one. I encourage people to check it out. Uh, Juwan, if you can find it and drop a link in the chat, it, it's actually incredibly accessible and very, uh, I think the community will find it exciting. Um, but one of the things that struck me is, you know, D-Climate, it makes me think about weather data, but it's way more than weather data. Like you guys are talking about all different kinds of stuff, not just soil moisture, but like methane content and epidemic and, and disease sort of things. Like, can, can you talk about the different kinds of data you have in mind in your vision? Yeah, so the vision was always uh, any type of data that touches our biosphere. So, uh, so in, and the thing is that it's it, it all flows naturally with uh, e each other, right? So weather is obviously very important but if you're a farmer it's not just about weather you also want to know about uh, pests for your crops soil moisture right. is very important to see how much rainfall your crop actually needs um, you know crop yield data itself is very hard to get uh, in many parts of the world and that's just uh, and that can be estimated by uh, optical satellite data it can be estimated by a radar satellite data in other parts, and I'm just going with crops as one example. Mm -hmm. um, there's entire ecosystems with other you know, anchors, if you will. So in crops, um, you have a huge problem in emerging markets when banks lend to farmers, they need to vet that the loan was actually used to grow the crop that they lent it for. How do you mm -hmm. do that? Well, there's different satellite imagery to assess what crop you're growing. So there's each of these anchors has a lot of related data sets that lead to um, you know, uh, different pools of data. So uh, we think, you know, for example, uh, wind data is becoming very, very important. But mm -hmm. onshore wind data is kind of different than offshore wind data. And offshore wind data is not uh, as widely available and forecasts for it are pretty bad. Um, you have, uh, but you have a large number of offshore wind farms coming online in the next few years. So, we, we see growing needs in all sorts of pockets. And so that's why it needs to be a cohesive climate, uh, you know, network rather than focusing on one particular silo. But at the same time, we didn't want to make a network that was just, you know, any data anywhere because climate data has very specific types of validation, you know, everything from carbon to weather forecasts mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, solar radiation. We need experts who can validate this data, who can understand this data, 
to then have a network that people can actually use. If you just start having networks that just have any type of data, then you're not targeting a specific user base. You're not targeting a specific data provider base. So we have a question from the audience that addresses this very point. So Steve, I'm going to pop your question up. Sid, Steve asks, can you expand on the human in the loop element of reputation for judging the quality of weather data? Is this a choke point? Yeah, a great question. And uh, you know, we we uh, we we will automate uh, all these different aspects. So we do not intend to use human validation. The human aspect will come in in the beginning. So there are tons of different validation metrics for things like weather forecasts, right? So imagine a weather forecast. That's a great example. So weather forecast will tell you there's a seventy percent chance of rain, but on the day it either rains or it doesn't. Right? It's, it's a probabilistic estimate of an actual event. So there's various metrics that deal with this, and we will incorporate different metrics to give users a full scale view. Some people are, uh, some companies might be great at forecasting storms like extreme events. Others might be good at forecasting whether it's going to be a prolonged drought. So we'll try to give a large set of metrics uh, on this, and this will all be done via chain link nodes to uh, you, you know, essentially va uh, provide decentralized validation. But we intend the human element to be at the beginning where we frame out how this will work, but then it's all run by a code. Uh, great question, Steve, and, and thanks, Sid. You know, my, my next question uh, on the, uh, my, my doc is how are you using Chainlink? Uh, I think we, we kind of know how you're using Chainlink here. Can you talk a little bit about like what Chainlink brings and, and how, yeah. Um, yeah. We we are we are going to be uh, extensively integrated with Chainlink and built really uh, you know with Chainlink in mind. So um, you know, in fact, the Chainlink team helped uh, you know uh, sort of we refined our white paper ideas with uh, the Chainlink team because first of all, on the node level, there's a very uh, you know important purpose they serve between getting this data, validating it, running code on it, and connecting it to the consumer, and at the climate, our skill set is about the climate data, about the, the, the different user bases and understanding how a marketplace can be built. We didn't want to get into building oracles because Chainlink is already the expert at that, right? We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So I think Chainlink forms a very important base layer for us. And then we'll be uh, you know, uh, unique in the sense that we'll also be using Chainlink for the governance layer. So a lot of the, uh, you know, on the uh, sort of day-to-day -day side, the, the DAO's job will be to select different Chainlink nodes as validators. And so uh, Chainlink sort of starts from the base layer, but it really goes all the way up to the DAO in terms of our operations. I've heard uh, Chainlink people uh, involved in the ecosystem talk a little bit. Chainlink God, actually, I heard recently talk about this on Bankless of you can build your own Oracle network how you want to, depending on your needs. And that to me is a really abstract concept until now. Like th this right. is it. You guys don't care about price data. You're not interested in these other oracles. You need a specific set of nodes that do a specific task for yep. weather data in a given geo location, right? Yep. Maybe it's a, a, a small, right? A metro area, New York City itself, or or larger or, or wider. Um, and so figuring right. out how to how to tune that just right and get the right nodes reporting the right data is. Uh, it sounds like a Herculean task, actually. That's what you guys are up to, right? Yeah, uh, we, you know, we have spent about uh, co over two years on the data side, right? Building out the decentralized cloud infrastructure that um, you know forms the base layer of what we are offering. So that helps a lot in terms of getting us started, right? We start with a thousand plus mm -hmm. terabytes of data that has been meticulously cleaned and checked and is used in actual contract settlement. So there's a, uh, and that's one of the unique things about us as a network is like we're starting out with a lot behind us. And then, you know, chain link nodes have access to that as a starting point. And then as we add more external data providers, you know, we'll, we'll work with uh, the chain link team to make it as simple as possible for external data providers to add to the climate. Uh, I'm, I have a data nerd question. How dirty is climate data? Like, like the, mm -hmm. when the raw data is coming in from sensors and all that, like, there's got to be a process that is, uh, what, what are some of those challenges? Is it all the same format now? Is there a standard or is right. that what you guys are working on? 
Yeah, so there's definitely no format. I mean, some of these things are in <laughs> file names that haven't uh, been widely used <laughs> since the 1980s. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the problem is that, you know, when you talk about even something like weather data, there's no such thing, really. Um, there's no one corpus of weather data. It sounds, you know, when we, for, uh, when we first started talking about the climate and even Arbol to people who are not in this market, it's like, well, I can just pull up my phone and I see the weather data. But it's, um, you know, uh, to, to use a cliche term, it's so much more complex than that, right? So you have, um, you have station data. So there's tons of different types of weather stations all over the world. Some are maintained by the US government, some are maintained by national agencies, some by local groups, some by universities. Each has different formats, different reliability, uh, some of them may have gaps that are like six months long in some random time. Uh, some break down at times, some break down more easily than others. So first of all, you have this overlapping mesh of weather stations. Then you have other data sets that incorporate uh, satellite data into this weather station mesh. So satellites can assess rainfall, temperature, and things like that, but uh, their accuracy varies a lot by the topography. Right, so if you're in a mountainous mm -hmm. area, so we were talking to a coffee group uh, out in uh, Central America, and they were like, well, on the one side of the mountain, the weather can be completely different than the other side, and that matters a lot for your coffee crop. And satellite data is too crude for that. Uh, and then some data sets are uh, not blended, they're pure satellite. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just for historical weather data. We haven't even touched things like sensors and things like that. So we work with, yeah. for example, insurance programs for like organic crops, which don't have great uh, federal government coverage. We're getting sensor data from on the farm, from the tractor, from the scale. That stuff gets, uh, and trying to measure the output of the crop, and that stuff gets extra messy. You have soil moisture, satellite data, and sensor data. So yeah, the, the, the point being, it's all different formats. Different agencies use different uh, metrics. Um, you know, and uh, there's no real documentation for a lot of this data. Mm. Like basic stuff, like finding out what units you're reporting in, can be a huge challenge. Um, yeah. I think we were we were looking at a rainfall data set where the unit was like uh, I think kilograms of water per per meter cubed, and then when we did it out, it's like the same thing as millimeters of rain or something. And it, it's like this kind of crazy, uh, opaque, you know, mm. stuff. When you go to other countries, uh, the data quality drops sharply, as you might expect. But I mean, in some countries, the entire country, like the size of uh, you know uh, Texas, can have like one weather station. So you you start to get huge problems in in emerging markets where you have uh, satellite and all this uh, stuff that needs to be filled in. But yeah, yeah, the list of problems goes uh, on and on, basically. You, you have a list of problems, it means you have a list of solutions for the future. So that's my optimism coming out. Right. I came from a, a complex systems background and the oh, weather cool. data, yeah. like the modeling, Lauren's modeling was always kind of like our gold standard. You can yeah. actually predict pretty well. You can't predict that well, but compared to other complex phenomenon, there's enough data, but still that data is still very limited and we're still working on that as evidenced okay. by compare my weather app to my wife's weather app, we get totally different yeah. things. And, and the thing that is that, that you, your, the prediction point is also great because predictions up to two weeks are acceptable. There's a huge drop off after. And that's because when you, you know, take the physical model and move it forward, the chaotic problems build up. Now mm -hmm. with machine learning and uh, you know, uh, neural nets and a lot of AI methods, people are starting to push that barrier and there's other models to predict three months out or four months out. And, you know, that's extremely useful for what we do, for example. I mean, farmers mm -hmm. don't want the next one week forecast, they may want the seasonal drought forecast. So you're actually seeing a huge explosion in different types of models that are trying to predict everything from droughts to wind speeds over longer time frames, And they don't have a great platform to put all this on. And that's a, another reason uh, for where declimate can really make a difference is this there's totally a lot speaks, of demand on that. This totally speaks to the democratization you were talking about this data. It, uh, my, it's a retail consumer, tell me the weather tomorrow app. If I get past seven days, 
who knows? It, it, yeah. it just says, here's what's last year. The real enterprise data that insurance companies and people who, who need this right. data to make decisions, it's available, but only for a really limited subset of people. Um, and, and that's and it's very really expensive. hard to access. Yeah. Uh, you know, very expensive. I mean, uh, uh, like insurance settlement quality weather data will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's just historical. Uh, you try to do more advanced stuff like simulating, uh, you know, damage from the next hurricane. I mean, you're talking about millions of dollars, yeah. if not tens of millions. And so what you end up with is a system where only a few companies, a few very large entities can afford these things. And, the, you know, the rest of there's no democratization, basically. So I'm totally hogging, uh, <laughs> monopolizing my time here with you because I, I, I enjoy this. But I'm going to get to some of our questions. Uh, Krishna has a question that I think ties into Arbol, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about how uh, Declimate and Arbol are connected. Uh, how do you plan to bring this data to farmers? Are there applications built um, in, in, involved on blockchain, either on Ethereum or, or other chains? How does that work with Arbol? Yeah, so this data, um, you know, to bring it to farmers and more sort of, you could call it semi-retail customers, where we're gonna be adding a lot of uh, visual tools. And farmers are actually, you know, are big consumers of weather data, as you might imagine, They're, they use apps and a lot of other things. And what we wanna do is provide a simple platform where they can, um, you know, not just get forecasts, but also start to have uh, different players contributing yield models. So. I, let's say I grow wheat in Kansas, who has the best forecast for yields? You know, what are different weather, uh, 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 what, what are different crop yield forecasting providers saying? And, you know, who has had the best forecast in the last few years? Not just, I don't wanna see just a range, but I wanna see, okay, who ha who's good at forecasting in my area for my stuff? So I think to really add value on the farmer level, you know, we'll just ha we'll have a lot of analytics that build on weather to get them what they need. And this is where the open decentralized nature really starts to add value, is you're not relying on any one data provider, you are getting the best in class from all sorts of different providers competing for your business. Yeah, I'm super excited about innovation potential, and I imagine a student hackathon at Kansas State, just some university in, in your example, and they could put together a, a weather model for this exact thing, data in Kansas. And Absolutely. what if it turns out to be the best? Then yeah. suddenly, you know, you launch your business and you've got a, yeah. a really interesting model on local topography. Yeah, we have we plan to have lots of these hackathons, and I think that you're exactly right. There's a there's a lot of small groups that produce very interesting, very high quality models for their local area, and that's what we want to highlight. Uh, Steve's got another question. How do you get individuals to deploy weather stations or sensors in their area, metro or rural or otherwise? Yeah, so the idea is that, you know, the one of the key concepts of D-Climate is to have bounties for different uh, weather data to be added. Uh, what, the, what that will depend on is how scarce is data in the area you're deploying and how wide scale, right? So in many countries, there's actually a lot of local weather groups that don't get the platform again to produce, uh, provide their stuff. Uh, we've been talking to a group that uh, does weather balloons out in West Africa, an area that's very important for, uh, you know, cocoa farmers and cocoa traders. Uh, among many other commodities, I traded cocoa as well for many years. But their weather data there is extremely lacking, um, and you know, in, in that way, we we are very much about incentivizing that. It just, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, as the network evolves, it'll respond to user needs. So, you know, in New York City, you might have a lot of data. So that marginal data is not as useful. But, you know, in rural areas where even in the U.S., there's huge gaps. This becomes very important. Thanks for that question, Steve. Um, Sid, this has been fantastic. I, I feel like the rabbit hole goes super deep in terms of climate data. We didn't even touch, like, COVID and the pandemic and the potential there for learning about epidemics and its relation to some of these things. So let's let's put a pin in that and save that for another conversation. Absolutely. Um, what's next for D-Climate? What's in your roadmap? What are you guys up to? Yeah, so we are, uh, you know, uh, building the network, like, uh, and hiring and just, like, really expanding uh, the, the products we can offer. At the same time, in parallel, we're always adding data uh, to the network. Uh, Arbol will be an anchor client. So D-Climate starts not just with a lot of data, 
but with an anchor client. And so we are working, making sure that those links are ready to go as we launch uh, live. Uh, so our plan is to li- uh, launch the mainnet uh, sometime this summer. And in the meantime, we're also lining up a ton of really great partnerships, which, uh, and then advisors, which we'll start to publicize very soon. We're just sort of been in uh, you know, focus build mode uh, to really get a few concrete things done. Awesome. Well, where can uh, this audience and future audience, where, where can we follow you and follow Decline? Yeah, uh, I'd love uh, for anybody who's interested to join our uh, Telegram group. And uh, there's more info on our website. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I guess we can share the link uh, on uh, from our team. But uh, the, the, the Telegram group and uh, we have a Discord group for the more uh, technical focus guys. And, uh, yeah, we'd love everyone on there. All right, uh, Juwan's adding some links in there. I'll make sure to have those in the YouTube description as well. So anybody watching this video can find them. Here's my plea to you. If you're watching this, join the D Climate group, join Arbol groups, join Chainlink, Discord, and Telegram, and participate in these communities. That's where these relationships are made, where we have these discussions and, and start uh, having some really cool conversations like this. Sid, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You let me Thank geek you. out a little bit on data stuff, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, having me on, and it's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, To everyone, thank you for attending. Juan, thank you for being here and uh, helping me out in the chats uh, and all our fantastic questions. Uh, Everyone, my name is Andy Boyan with Chainlink Labs, and this has been Chainlink Live. Come again to these.